Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. Lord, I just thank God for another opportunity to, to be here for a great privilege of being able to be part of this, this great ministry, Lighthouse for Jesus Sanctuary of Strength. Hallelujah. I just feel humbled by another opportunity to be able to come before you and minister the word of God. Amen. It's, it's definitely not anything that I ever take lightly to, to come before God's people and to give anything that would... um speak a word into your lives, amen. So I'm, I'm praying that um, this message that God has given me today would definitely be something that's, that someone would uh, be receptive of. I pray for the hearts um, that's going to be listening to and hearing this message. I pray that the ears will be open. I pray that God would give me utterance, amen, to, um, through his spirit to be able to speak those things that are necessary for people's heart to receive, in Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. So um, the, the title of, of the message that I have for today uh, is called The Wounds of a Friend. Again, the title is called The Wounds of a Friend, amen. And so some of the things that I'm going to be talking about, and uh, I'm not going to be before you very long, but some of the things that I'm going to be talking about in this message um, are some, some, some can sometimes be very unpopular, can be an unpopular subject. Um, it has to do with, uh, it's misleading because when you think of the wounds of a friend, um, many times you think about someone that's supposed to be close to you that will do something to you or say something to you or handle you in a way that will hurt you and wound you. And, um, and sometimes that's the most difficult things for, for you to be able to get past or hurt to get past is when somebody close to you hurts you or wounds you who's supposed to be a friend. But in this particular message, um, the wounds of a friend isn't referring to um, someone close to you that hurts you in a, in a bad way. Um, this message, the wounds of a friend, is referring to um, a friend that was that will tell you something that you may not necessarily want to hear, whether it be just a, a friend, whether it be a relative, whether it be a minister or a pastor, but that will tell you something that's actually for your own good, but you might not want to hear it. And um it might it may wound you in the sense of how you receive it, but it's really it's really a, a good thing that they're trying to do by telling you that, amen. So we're going to go into a few scriptures and, and see what the Bible says about the wounds of a friend, amen. The first scripture we're going to go to would be out of the book of Proverbs, chapter 27. We're going to read verses 5 through 6, amen. Proverbs, chapter 27, verses 5 through 6, all right. And it says, open rebuke is better than secret love. Verse 6 says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Amen. I'm going to read that again. Verse 5 says, open rebuke is better than secret love. And verse 6 says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Well, how can, how can a friend wound you and it be a faithful thing? Amen. So, a lot of people, they have a, a very difficult time dealing with being rebuked, being with reproved. Like, I, I find that in the time frame, definitely that we're living in now, um, you find less and less people that want to surround themselves with people that will, that will make them uncomfortable and tell them things that they don't want to hear. So many times what you find is people that surround themselves with people who agree with Every, everything that they say, agree with everything that you do. And many times, the things that you think and say and do, if it's not consistent with the word of God, then it's, then it's according to your flesh. You know, and you, you need people around you that's, that'll be willing to tell you the truth. You need people around you that's going to be willing to disagree with you. You know, just because a person is a friend, it doesn't mean that they have to <laughs> agree with you all the time. That's really not a true friend. But you know you have a true friendship whenever y'all can hold each other accountable 
Amen. And that, that friendship won't be fractured or broken because there's a respect level there because of the accountability that that friend holds you to. Amen. Uh, and we find that the, that the Bible um, promotes this, man. Our next verse that we're going to go to uh, is out of Proverbs ch um, chapter 17. And we're going to read verse 10. It's going to be Proverbs chapter 17. The 10th verse says, <laughs> A reproof enters more into a wise man than a hundred stripes into a fool. I'll read that one more time. A reproof or a rebuke enters more into a wise man than a hundred stripes into a fool. Man, my next verse is going to be at Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs chapter 9. Verse 1. Um, verse 8. And it reads, if you reprove, it tells you to reprove not a scorner, lest he hate you. But if you rebuke a wise man, he will love you. Read that again. Reprove not a scorner, unless he hates you. But if you rebuke a wise man, he will love you. So, we see in these two verses that a wise man, or, or whether you're a wise man or whether you're a fool, is, is it determined by how you respond to someone that rebukes you. <laughs> you know, so a lot of times whenever people come to us, and, you know, we know that the Bible says we should speak the truth to one another in love. Of course, um, we, we speak in a lot of different ways than the things that we just say, right? There's a, um, we can say something, but we could say it in the wrong way and it'll be received in a totally different way because we, because we said it wrong. Or there's body language. There's a such thing as body language where we could, we could be saying something, but our body language is saying something totally different. So, of course, when we come and we, and we come to uh, a friend or somebody with a word of correction or rebuke or to hold them accountable, it should be done with, with love. Amen. You, it should be presented in the right way. But a lot of times, regardless of how that person comes, when sometimes when a person comes to tell you something that you that you don't want to hear because your mind is fixed and you're setting your way on a certain thing, then you'll you'll reject what that person is saying. And sometimes we feel that them coming and holding us accountable or correcting us something is telling us a lot about them and negative things about them. But we don't realize a lot of times that the way you respond to, to reproof or rebuke um, is really saying more about you. You know what I mean? And, and it's saying that if you, if you tell, if you go to a wise man and you rebuke him, he'll love you. He'll love you. But if you go to a fool or a scorner, and tell them something they don't want to hear and reprove and rebuke or reprove them, they'll hate you. So you can, you can find out a whole lot about an individual, about how they respond to rebuke or reproof. You can find out a lot about an individual if they're a wise person or if they're foolish by how they respond to rebuke or reproof. Amen? Hallelujah. Our next verse we're going to go to is uh, in the book of Psalms, chapter one. 41, verse 5. Psalms, chapter 141, the fifth verse. <clears throat> and it reads, let the righteous smite me. And I think this was um, King David that was writing this. He said, let the righteous smite me. It shall be a kindness. And let him reprove me. It shall be an excellent oil. Which shall, which shall not break my head. For yet my prayer also shall be with, in their calamities. Amen. So David, <laughs> David had experience with this because, you know, David was, was a, a part of the Bible. He was a man after God's own heart. Amen. And, um, but there was, there was some incidents and situations in David's life where as, as much as David loved God 
as much as David understood the mercy of God, as much faith as David had, David had situations himself that were that things that he did that were very egregious at times. And even King David, who was the king and the ruler over all of Israel, God put people in David's life. God put the prophet Nathan in David's life. And we read in our Bible that the, the, the incident with, that happened with Bathsheba, when David got to a point to where he slept with another man's wife, and then he got her pregnant, and then he decided to take that man and sent him on the battlefield on the front lines to get him killed to have his wife we see that David apparently had got to a point where he had got comfortable in that in the situation that maybe it was a situation where the power and authority that he had maybe he became drunk by his own power and and um and there was some corruption that entered in there where he felt look man I'm the king I could, I could do whatever I want. But at that, he wasn't perfect. But at that particular time, there was a prophet, a prophet named Nathan that God sent to David to hold him accountable for what he did. Because apparently, if, if David would have had the ability to see it within himself and to self-correct that situation, God would have never sent the prophet to him. But there was a need for God to send a prophet to him to confront him and to hold him accountable for that situation. And Whenever he was confronted with it, David, David didn't do like a lot of the other kings of Israel did when prophets went to him and wanted to have him killed. You know, the true prophets that was going to him telling them the things that God really wanted them to know for their best interest and was going to get the other prophets, the false prophets that lied to him and tell them what they wanted to hear. That's not how David responded. When Nathan confronted him, David repented. As soon as God used Nathan to confront him about what he did, his so it showed us that even though David done a foolish thing, David wasn't a foolish man. The foolishness was just something that he did, but it wasn't characteristic of who he was because whenever he was confronted with his actions, he responded like a wise man responded. Amen? So we, we see him apparently reflecting back on that situation. Um, and saying in verse 5, he said, man, let the, let the righteous smite me. Let them hit me. Let them correct me with the rod of correction. Let them do it. He said, it shall be a kindness. He said, and let them reprove me. He said, and I like this, it shall be an excellent oil, an excellent oil which shall not break my head. Bre break your head and mean to destroy you. So David, David had an understanding and a great value for the reproof and the, for the rebuke and the correction that God gives to us when we need it. He understood it to be, he called it an excellent oil. Amen. And he said that it was something that wasn't going to destroy him. Amen. Hallelujah. But an excellent oil is something, an ointment that could be used to soothe you, that could be used to heal you. Amen. So my goal in going through a lot of these scriptures is just to, is just to try to Give maybe a different perspective sometimes on some people that you may surround yourselves around people who tell you everything that you want to hear. Uh, and we and, and our next scripture where we're gonna go, we're gonna we're gonna read a little bit about um, what the truth is behind flattery, behind all all of the people that we may think that are our friends that really, really love us, that's all the ones that, that agree with us with everything that we say, even if it's contrary to the word of God, and tell us everything that we want to hear and make us feel comfortable in, in our carnality. Uh, so let's, let's, let's read Proverbs chapter 26, verse 28, and see what the truth, what's really behind flattery. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 28. If y'all give me some time to get there. Chapter 26, verse 28. It says, a lying tongue hates, really hates those that are afflicted by it. And a flattering mouth really works ruin. I'm going to read that again. A lying tongue, it actually hates those that are afflicted by it. And a flattering mouth 
it works ruin. Amen. So we see clearly um, that we may need to uh, maybe um, get, gain a different perspective sometimes on the people that, that may be around us, the people that, you know how we like to say, the people that I have in my circle. You know, we, people like to say my circle small. Well, however small your circle is, you, you, I don't think we need to be as concerned about the size of our circle, but more so about the people that's in it. And what type of people are they? Are they people like the prophet Nathan that's willing to come to us and confront us and tell us the truth about ourselves in love when we really need it? Or is it people that's going to make us comfortable in our sin, that's going to make us comfortable in our car carnality? Weak-minded people that's not willing to challenge themselves and that's not willing to challenge you. You will never grow. They will never grow. I think even Jesus said in his word that the blind cannot lead the blind. They both will fall into a ditch. You understand what I'm saying? So um, we, we need to surround ourselves with people that are willing to challenge us. People that won't. Um, now, if you got people around you that's challenging um, the word of God in your life, <laughs> if you're trying to walk according to the word of God and they're challenging that, that's, that's not the type of um, confrontation that I'm talking about. You need to separate yourself from anybody that tries to tear down or challenge the word of God in your life. But um, if it comes to anything in your life that's contrary to the word of God, and you have someone or you don't have anyone in your life that's willing to call that out, then you really don't have anybody in your corner that's really looking out for your best interest. R really, you got to understand what's behind the flattery. It's that flattering mouth that they're using is really working towards your destruction. And the spirit that's really behind that flattery is really hatred. Now, I didn't say it. I didn't say it. The word of God said it. Amen. Hallelujah. Our next verse we're going to go to is Proverbs chapter 28, verse 23. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 23. And it reads, he that rebukes a man afterwards shall find more favor than he that flattereth with the tongue. <laughs> I'm going to read that one more time. He that rebukes a man, although they may initially, they might not always initially take it the right way. Afterwards, he will find more favor than he that flatters with the tongue. Amen. Um, that's people that give honest criticism. If you're the type of person that will give honest criticism, not, not the type of criticism where you just always looking for uh, to cut somebody down. To test somebody on, you know, but productive criticism, honest criticism. A person, if you got a person that that you you go to that person and you give them honest criticism, they may not receive it the right way initially, but they but in the end they always gonna end up respecting you and appreciating you a lot more than that person that flattered them and told them what they wanted to hear. I've, I've experienced this a lot in a lot of different situations that I've been. I've been on jobs and um, jobs, a lot of jobs, and I've ran across a lot of people, places where I no longer work. But to, to this day, it's strange because every job I ever worked on, all of the people that I encountered and ran across on those jobs always call me. <laughs> they call me randomly. They keep in touch with me. I have a very close place to their heart, and most of them were sinners. Most of them were people that didn't even have the Holy Ghost and were saved. But because of the life that I live, because I spoke the truth to them in love, even though we didn't always agree at times, those people have a deep appreciation for my walk in God, for who I am in God. Amen. So I've experienced that myself, and I have found um, that, that many people, whenever you speak the truth to them, albeit in love, they will respect you more. Amen? Um, the next scripture we're going to go to is in 2 Timothy, the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 4. And we're going to read verses 2 through 4. It's going to be 2 Timothy, chapter 4, 
starting at the second verse all the way to the fourth verse. This is the Apostle Paul giving instructions to Timothy, who was a, who was a young man at the time, amen. And his instructions in verse 2 were, he's telling him to preach the word. Be instant, in season, and out of season. Rebuke, reprove. So that's part of it. Rebuke. Exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Um, that word itching comes from the Greek word nepho. It means to scratch, to tickle. Desirous of hearing something pleasant. Um, in verse 4, they shall turn away their ears from the truth and they shall be turned unto fables. Amen. So we see that it's already been prophesied um, because we know that although it was through Paul's voice, we know that no scripture was of any private interpretation. It didn't come from man. It didn't come by the will of man. But, but all scripture is, was inspired by God as God breathed. Holy men spoke as they were moved by the spirit of Christ. So I say it all the time that the whole Bible should be written in red. <laughs> you know, they only have the, the gospels written in red. But the whole Bible should be written in red because the entirety of the Bible was all God's breath, God's voice, God's spirit moving upon men of God who spoke after they were moved by his spirit, amen. And we hear what the spirit of God is telling Timothy, not only Timothy, but telling us in this time that he saw it, the spirit of God saw it, that the time was going to come that we're currently in now where people would not be able to endure being, being held accountable, being a person confronting them, in a love, even if it was in a loving way, he seen that there was going to be a time that was going to come, and we're in that time now where people would not be receptive of the word of God. Amen. We have so many ministries and so many churches, they don't even preach against sin anymore. Amen. And I, I run into a lot of people that tell me straight up, I don't want to go to a church and, and hear about nobody preaching to me about sin. I don't want to hear that. Like, they, if they want to go to a church, they want to go to a church where the things that they're being told are things that they desire to hear. What they consider to be positive things, they don't want to hear anything negative. None of the word of God is negative. None of the word of God is negative. Everything that God says is good, whether it be through reproof, whether it be through rebuke, you have to understand any time that God says, thou shalt, he's not a cruel dictator that's trying to boss you around. Anytime God says, thou shalt, he's saying, help yourself. If he says, thou shalt not, he's saying, don't hurt yourself. That's his intentions behind anything he tells you to do or not to do. So there's a blessing behind all of God's word. There's a blessing behind something that he tells you to do that you may consider to be positive. There's a blessing behind something that he tells you not to do. If you be obedient to that, there's a blessing behind that. Amen. So um, we need to definitely examine ourselves and, and see where we, where we stand on an individual level. Me first. Um, when it comes to do we have people in our corner, uh, it's easy, you know, for people to tell us the things that we want to hear. It's easy for people to tell us the good things. It's easy for somebody to prophesy to us and tell us, hey, you got a calling on your life. God called you to be this. God called you to be that. It's easy for somebody to prophesy and say, you know, God going to bless you with a house. God going to bless you with a car. God going to bless your finances. We can all be receptive to that. But will we be as receptive if God comes to you with a correction and a, re and a, a reproof, amen, for something that's not right in your life that you need to correct. We, we need to understand that the people that God sends in our life to, to hold us accountable, that's an excellent oil, like David said. Let, let the righteous smite me. It's going to be an excellent oil. It's going to be a kindness. It's not going to destroy me. Amen. It's going to build me. Amen. Um, 
our last, our last scripture is going to be out of Hebrews chapter 12. And uh, first we're going to read verses 5 through 8, and then we're going to skip down to verse 11. So it's going to be Hebrews chapter 12. Verses 5 through 8. Um, and it reads, Have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as unto children? My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you are rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastises, and he scourges every son who he receives. For if ye endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then you are bastards and not sons. So clearly, if you have a child, whether it be a son or a daughter, and you don't chastise them and correct them when they need correction, you don't love them. You know what I'm saying? If, if you see your child and they they going close to playing in the street, and you tell them, don't play in the street, and they keep going back, eventually, you're going you're gonna to spank that hand. It's, it's discipline. Discipline is, is not for the, uh, you know, for the purpose of I'm angry, so I need to let my anger out. Discipline is corrective action. That's, that's the purpose and the goal behind it, is to correct that action. So if you spank that hand, it's because you love them. It, but if you don't love them, you're, just, you're not going to correct them. You'll let them run out into the street and get hit, man. So we have to understand that the, if you've gone through chastisement, if God, is, if God is correcting you through your pastor, if God is correcting you through a fellow um, man or woman of God, a friend, that's because God loves you. You know, that's because God loves you. And, and we should be thankful, we should be grateful that God loves us enough, that he cares about our souls enough to chastise us and correct us when we are wrong. If, we, if he wasn't doing that, the Bible says you are like a bastard. You will be a fatherless child. But we're not a fatherless child. And we know that because of the correction that he brings in our lives, amen. And our last verse, I think I said we're going to drop down to verse 10. Verse 11. Verse 11 says, Now, no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, after it, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Amen. So we're seeing there that <clears throat> it, it doesn't feel good when God corrects us. <laughs> you know, it, do, it doesn't feel good whenever you have an overseer that God uses, you know, to pull out that whipping stick. <laughs> and they have the authority to do that. You know, overseer, your spiritual leader has authority as a spiritual father or a spiritual mother to pull that whipping stick out from time to time. Hallelujah. God has given that, them that rod of correction to use when it's necessary, man. And um, we see that when that happens, God is, God is doing that because he's, he's trying to develop a character in you that's like him, amen. A character in you that's gonna that's gonna enable you to be able to receive your inheritance, to be able to receive your internal inheritance. If we stay carnal minded, we know what the Bible says: to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded, we know is life and peace, amen. So God uses correction, God uses chastisement, and He does it to to correct us. To get, out, get us out of our carnal mind and to help frame and mold and shape into us a spiritual mind. Amen. Hallelujah. So I thank God for that, uh, for that word. Amen. And um, I think uh, the, the last thing that I want to do is just share some, some quotes that, I, that I, I found and found pretty interesting. Um, one of them says, the more we love our friends, the less we flatter them. It is by excusing nothing that pure love actually shows itself. I'm going to read that quote one more time. It says, the more we love our friends, the less we flatter them. 
It is by exercise, it is by excusing nothing that pure love really shows itself, man. The second quote I have says, we swallow greedily any lie that flatters us, but we tend to sip only little by little at a truth that we find bitter. Amen. We need to change that around, people of God. Um, we, we, need, we need to learn how to become hostile towards the, the devil, towards a flattering tongue and the hatred that we just read is really behind, the spirit of hatred that's really behind it. We need to learn how to become hostile towards that and we be, need to learn how to become, to yield ourselves more openly and more receptively to correction. Amen. We don't need to, we need to stop being willing to sip a little bit at a time a correction or a reproof that we that we perceive to see perceive to be something bitter, amen. That's that's the excellent oil. That's that's the that's the salve that you need to really heal you. That you really need to challenge you to cause you to grow out of that carnal state of mind and into the spiritual giant, so to speak, that God really desires for you to be. Amen. Hallelujah. So. That's, that's all I have for y'all. I didn't really have much, um, but um, just something that's just short and sweet. I'm hoping that um, it was something that somebody got something out of that, um, that y'all would be able to take and just all do self-examination and see if it's, if it's some areas where a little bit of work can be done on that. Amen. So I'm going to just um, end in a word of prayer. Father, Lord God, I just thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity, Father, Lord God, to minister before your people. I thank you for being part of of this great ministry under our apostle, Donnie Bolden Sr. And his, and his lovely wife, Father, Lord God, Sister Cynthia Bolden, Father, Lord God. Father, Lord God, I just pray, Lord God, that you would touch the hearts and the minds of your people, Lord God. You once spoke a word through our prophetess, oh God, and said that the spiritual man has become mad. Amen. And Father, you said that a time, Lord God, will come where there will be a famine. Father, not, not of not of the word of God, but a famine of hearing the word of God, oh God. So, Father, we, Lord God, we send out, Father, your word, Father, Lord God, upon the winds, oh God. And, Father, Lord God, we speak, Father, Lord God, to the minds, Father, Lord God, Father, that the enemy has brought into a state, Father, Lord God, maybe of temporary insanity, Father, Lord God. Lord, those that may have had emotional, Lord God, and nervous breakdowns, Father, Lord God, where, Lord God, the things that they feel have taken a hold of the reins, Lord God, of their lives, Father, Lord God. And, Father, Lord God, they're not, Lord God, being able to see and understand and perceive things clearly, Lord God, as they would through your spirit, Father, Lord God. You are not the author of confusion, oh God. You have not, oh God. You, you have given us, Lord God, the spirit of a sound mind, oh God. Lord God, a power of loving of a sound mind, oh God. So, Father, I speak soundness to the minds, oh God. I speak restoration, oh God, to the hearts, oh God. Father, that those, Lord God, Father, Lord God, that... Lord God, people, Lord God, that would have people in their lives, Father, Lord God, that may be around them, Father, Lord God, they may be flattering them, Father, Lord God, and maybe telling them things that they want to hear or making them feel comfortable, Lord God, in states of carnality, Lord God, I pray, Lord God, that you will work a work, oh God, that your spirit, Father, Lord God, will work a work in their hearts and their minds and cause, Lord God, them to arise, oh God, cause them to wake up, Father, Lord God, Father, and to begin, oh God, to see, Father, Lord God, that spirit for what it is, oh God, and that their hearts, oh God, will become to become more receptive, oh God, to your people, oh God, that you sent to them, Father, Lord God, to reprove them, to rebuke them in love, oh God, and to cause them to grow, Lord God, and to mature into who you have called them to be, Lord God. Father, I ask it, Father, in your, in your powerful name, Lord God. Amen. Thank y'all. Hallelujah. I just thank y'all for giving me this opportunity to be able to minister to y'all. Hope everybody got something out of it. I love y'all. Y'all pray my strength in the Lord. I'm going to pray y'all. Thank you.